Hello, everyone. The interwebs are slow this morning. Ah, and the pollen is bothering me. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Doing pretty well. How about you? All right. I have posted the next test. Of course, the practice test was posted last week, uh, but the next test is posted. And uh, you can continue, of course, to do the practice test, but the new test is actually due on uh, Monday night, 11.59 uh, p.m. I'm giving you four attempts this time, and it takes only your highest. You get the same usual amount of time. Uh, I've got to remember to moderate it so that I can get the people that have accommodations and get extra time on their uh, quiz as well, or the practice test as well as the test. So I'll take care of that right after class. So make sure you get that done. And I uh, figured out why Canvas doesn't report for my class and my Canvas courses, why it doesn't report to you guys. Hey, you got a test to, you know, that little warning off to the side. Uh, we stopped some time ago using the due date specifically because so many students would miss things, especially on these internet classes. I mean, on these quarantine type classes. And uh, because they'd miss an assignment, what you do is say, okay, well, you got an excused miss, so I'm going to let you make up this assignment. And you open it back up, and then they go to try to take it, and then they email you. And it's now been like two days. Of course, they email you, tell you it won't open. That's because the assignment uh, due date was set. So we stopped setting the assignment due date and just worked everything with when it was due uh, or when it disappeared. So I stopped doing that and in the process, you, you guys lost the ability to see a last warning saying, hey, your test is due today. So anyways, I think I took care of that. Uh, hopefully it'll work. Uh, so you have a test that's on chapter seven and eight. Of course, all tests are comprehensive in physics, but this one's mostly on seven and eight. And you have until uh, Tuesday at 11, or excuse me, Monday at 11.59 PM to get that done, all four attempts. So, uh, Get started on that. Don't miss it, folks. And of course, keep up with your own assignments that we're doing throughout the week. This week, we're covering chapter nine. We should finish it uh, tomorrow or next time. So does anyone have any questions before we get started? I see a chat. Let's see what the chat was about. Oh, good morning. <laughs> People being polite. I love that. <clears throat> I apologize. I made up a question today about an AR-15. Uh, it's just a typical problem that I assign that has nothing obviously to do with uh, whatever happened in Corolla, uh, Colorado uh, last night or yesterday. That's uh, a terrible circumstance. I'm trying not ever in any sense trying to make light of any kind of violence other than, you know, when I say goofy stuff to get your attention, like and run through playgrounds with Mack trucks or stuff like that. But that's, you know, just me trying to catch your attention and shock you. So uh, just know that that question has nothing to do about that. It just is a typical question that we ask in, in physics when we're doing momentum. Uh, specifically, we talk about recoil and that's what that's about. So it looks like no one has any questions. So I guess uh, I I'll question. go ahead and get started. You sure no one has questions? Yeah, go for it, Lauren. I'll oh, I thought that, that was Lauren. Me. Maybe it wasn't. Whoever said that, go ahead. It was me. I was saying that uh, does the homework mess yeah, with the okay. homework? Go for it. The homework mess with just the. Uh, what do you mess mean? Does the homework mess with? The homework? Mess with... I, I said it wrong. But oh no no no! Uh, the the homework dates will still be. Yeah, I, guess, I think I know what you're saying. Yeah, the homework dates aren't changing. I did go back and fix those per your email. Thank you for that on chapter nine. I set that later. I've now got the entire. Uh, semester set up and those due dates should be pretty good for the rest of the semester. We'll see. I mean, if I get behind, obviously I have to change some due dates, but right now those due dates should be good. And I think I made them already available so you guys can actually start working ahead if you so desire. Uh, the videos, I've also posted all of them, all my old videos. So you have access to what I taught last semester for this course already. So you can literally start going ahead, making sure you understand uh, the material before you actually cover it, because you can see the videos that I did before. And then you can start doing you know, chapters ahead if you want. I don't recommend getting much farther than, say, one chapter ahead because you might actually forget what you did in that previous chapter when it's time to be tested on it. And you know, I don't want that to happen. So uh, 
I, I got to tell you guys, the, the main thing that bites everybody in the rear with physics as well as math is this great sense of confidence you derive from seeing me. Well, luckily, I've been screwing up a lot lately, so you, so you don't get much confidence in your ability to solve problems because you see me making crackhead mistakes. Uh, but, but generally, seeing someone easily solve the problem gives you a great deal of confidence thinking, oh, yeah, I can do that. That's easy peasy, right? And then you go and try to start your homework and you're like, I don't know where to start. Uh, that just comes from a lack of experience. And the only way to make your test grades better is to work a buttload of problems. My goal when I took this course, we used the Halliday Resnick textbook. That's like in its 13th edition now. It's now Halliday Resnick and Walker. Uh, it, it made so much money that Halliday and Resnick have donated uh, the proceeds from their textbook to their physics department at Rensselaer or Polytechnic. That's, that's how popular a textbook it is. But it's, it's really a, a pretty tough textbook, about as, easy, about as difficult as this, a little bit harder in some spots, easier than others. But uh, my goal in that was to solve uh, at least all the odd problems of every chapter. But I normally finish somewhere between a half and three quarters of all the odd problems in every chapter. So you'll notice a lot of the problems in your homework are problems that have been rendered in that homework system from the book. So that helps you too. So you can sort of deduct that, but shoot for trying to hit uh, at least half of the odd problems in the end of the chapter. I mean, you can subtract the number of ones you do for my homework, but really if you're not, uh, if you're not getting that many problems done, you're, you're not really ready. Uh, and that's gonna be even more so the case when you start taking statics and when you take dynamics and strength of materials, uh, which uh, virtually everybody's going to take statics and, and uh, dynamics. Uh, the strength of materials is more for uh, it, it, structural engineering, civil engineering, stuff like that. But again, all those courses, uh, engineering thermo, that's going to require you to solve a lot of problems. All those individual courses that you typically take in an engineering course are going to require you to have a lot of practice and, and uh, that's what you need to do to get your grades better. Uh, by the way, you know, taking the practice test is solving problems too. So each time you take one of those practice tests, you know, count the number of problems and deduct that from the half to three quarters of the odd problems uh, again. But I mean, work these not looking up the solution. I mean, if you have to look up the solution, that's fine. Look up the solution, then close the solution and solve it again. Okay. Uh, if you can't get all the way through it without looking back at the solution, keep doing it until you can and then go to the next problem. And after after some time doing that, and that's literally how we learned, we just, you know, uh, we didn't always have physics instructors that could do it. Well, they all were smart enough to solve the physics problems, but very few of them were motivated enough to have done the problems recently. So you go to your professor who has a PhD, he's got all these awards, he's got all this money coming in for research, and he's teaching your, you know, mechanics class and you say hey uh, I'm having some problems with this problem can you help me and he says oh I think you do this and then I go back and do that and come to find out that's a complete waste of time it was wrong you can't do it that way it wasn't that that way was wrong it's just that that way was not the best way and it ended up leading to a dead end so I had to find another way that's the way the instructors normally are if they haven't done the problems recently so we would have to learn by that method or by looking in things like Sean's outlines, seeing how those solutions are done. You guys got all this wealth of stuff at your fingertips between Khan Academy uh, and which I don't want to put my YouTube channel on the on par with Khan Academy or any of that stuff. Uh, but yeah, you've got you know people actually physically solving physical problems for you on the internet. So you know use that. Look look those up. See how they do it, and then forget about them and then use that to solve your problem. So anyways, just thought I'd give you that talk. We'll go ahead and get started. I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. I've written up some problems to solve. We're going into chapter nine. Actually, before I do that, let me give you a little intro to chapter nine. I'm gonna go ahead and turn on my document cam. And uh, chapter nine, is actually called conservation of, or excuse me, called linear momentum. And it's all about really conservation of linear momentum, which is a really, really important thing. It's the next thing uh, that is really relevant. We've done energy, we've done mechanics, uh, we've done kinematics, uh, but now we need something to deal with what happens when two things collide. Is there anything in there that can help us? Well, the thing that can help us is linear momentum. And then all we're lacking is actually angular momentum. And once we have angular momentum and linear momentum, we pretty much can solve just about everything. You know, Newton's laws of motion uh, could do it all, 
long as you know angular momentum and and uh, linear momentum. But uh, if you add conservation of energy, then you can do it a lot easier too. So that pretty much solves everything for the uh, whole semester until you get to thermodynamics. So that's all another bear. So uh, we know Newton's second law as, and I write it the way I do, which is the summation of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration. And this says so many things. Uh, I put this sigma here to remind you that F equals MA is not about a particular force. It's always has to be about all the forces total that are added up to act on mass M, okay? And it's only the forces acting on mass M. It has nothing to do with forces that M is applying to other thing. It has nothing to do with forces that are applied to the earth. It's all the forces acting on mass M result in an acceleration A given by this formula. It's a vector equation. So it shows you that not only the magnitude comes out of it, but the direction comes out of it. Meaning whatever direction the summation of all the forces is, M times A has to be the same direction. And since M is a uh, positive scalar, that means that A has to be parallel to the net force. So if someone says they pushed you off at this angle and you accelerated this way, you can say bit bull, right? <laughs> Unless some other force acting on you, like you tried not to fall and you know grabbed a table and fell the opposite direction, something like that. So that's F equals MA. But the way Newton uh, initially expressed it was this. He said the total force is equal to uh, basically the instantaneous rate of change of momentum, dP over dt, where p is defined to be mass times velocity. That's for a single object. Now, uh, you can actually do the same thing for a system of objects, in which case the total force on all the objects combined is equal to the instantaneous rate of change of the total momentum, in which case you'd have P1 plus P2 plus P3 plus P4, all that stuff, that works too. But in dealing with particle by particle basis, this is what you use and it makes perfect sense. Uh, momentum, as you can see, is a vector quantity. It's uh, indicated by the letter P. It has units of kilograms, meters per second. And obviously it's parallel to the velocity because again, mass cannot be negative. OK, uh, it does have things similar or in common with the uh, layman's version of momentum, like, uh, you know, a, a basketball host talking about the, he's got the momentum, baby. Right. And what that means is basically uh, you can't stop this team because they now are likely to keep on doing as good as they're doing. Well, momentum is that thing that makes it hard to stop or change its motion. So, yeah, in that sense, momentum makes sense. But it is a product of mass and velocity. Uh, if you double the mass, you double the momentum. If you double the velocity, you double the momentum. If you double, if you double the mass and triple the velocity, you six tuple the momentum. So that's how that works. And of course, it's different from kinetic energy in that kinetic energy was equal to one half mv squared, which is not a vector quantity. It depends directly on the mass, just like momentum. So if you double the mass, you double the kinetic energy but it depends on the square of the velocity. So if you double the velocity, you quadruple the kinetic energy. So that's where it's different, but that'll come into play again here because these two parameters, kinetic energy and momentum can be used for collisions. So if you drop back and recall that all derivatives initially start off as delta P, delta T's, right? Uh, and then you take the limit as delta T approaches zero, then the, uh, average net force is equal to delta P over delta T. So that's another typical result. And uh, using this, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, you know, I've already told you about the uh, momentum units or kilogram meters per second, <clears throat> which you notice is basically uh, uh, Newton times a second. It's another way of looking at it because the Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So you can also call it a Newton second. But this, this gives us another way of solving a problem. We can talk about uh, a force applied to something causing a change in momentum in a certain amount of time. And if you want to, you can say the total force average times delta T is equal to the change in momentum. And that's a quantity called impulse. 
think you can see it's a vector quantity, but it's the impulse. So that's another quantity here. And really the impulse is the change in momentum, but the way we normally think of it is we take the force applied, the average force applied and multiply it by the duration of the actual uh, application. And that gives us a total change in momentum. So if you've ever taken, if you've ever played softball or baseball, uh, your coach will tell you to hit through the ball. This is what they're talking about. Okay. They'll also say something about uh, swing level. Uh, that's a little weird to exactly explain it, but I, uh, I've often heard it said uh, you swing level, meaning you swing on the level that the ball is. So if the ball happens to be a softball, which is coming down at this angle, then swinging level means your bat should swing that way. Now, that's exactly what gets Major League Baseball players in trouble is they swing from low to high because everything they want to hit is a home run. But they're really not obeying the rule. You know, a, a baseball pitch is more likely to come in at this angle. So they should be really swinging along that plane as well. And the reason for that, just like the reason for hit, uh, hit through the ball, is you're maximizing the amount of time the bat is in contact with the ball. If you swing the same way the ball does, the ball has no choice, as long as you hit it cleanly, has no choice but to go back along the same line, and therefore you get to stay in contact with the ball a longer period of time. Delta T increases, your, fat, your force is probably as big as it can already be, unless you're, you're just a goober and, and, and haven't learned how to swing a bat, uh, <laughs> in which case that's not going to help you anyways. But by increasing the delta T, you increase the change of momentum, which remember is Final momentum is the mass times velocity that it leaves your bat with. The initial was the speed that it came in. You certainly want that to change a lot. So you want this delta P or impulse to be really huge. So all of that is in, in tune with that. That's also why, uh, you know, tennis rackets uh, are more efficient with string than they would be, say, with a, a rigid surface because a rigid surface would actually immediately make the thing bounce back and give no ability to elongate the time period that they're in contact with. So that's some of the physics behind and concepts behind uh, Newton's second law as written when uh, the way Newton did. So uh, it, it gets you a lot of different uh, facts and learning about how to hit things and, and, and do things, okay? Obviously, it, it applies to batting or excuse me, hammering nails as well, because if you just glance off a nail head, it's not going to do you much good. But if you hit it clearly then and, and straightly, then you'll see the hammer uh, touching the head of the nail for a long period of time, therefore uh, putting a large force and a long time period getting a great impulse in it. So now let's go to sharing the screen so we can see our first problem. Mm, not that one. Not that one. Yeah, I think it is that one. And I should probably share this before I screw up. Let's do file. I mean, save this before I screw up. File. Save as. Now, gosh, to change the name to 322, 323. Sorry, I've been watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer and uh, Spike and Drusilla have my voice in, in a British place right now, and I, I don't know why. Okay, so now I've got to say, so the first question we're going to ask answer is this. Well, I say question, but it's a little bit, it's a lot of things. So the fastest tennis serve ever recorded during competition was hit by Sam Groth from Australia. It was 167.3 mile per hour serve, which is 263.4 kilometers per hour. That's pretty dang fast. I remember uh, Pete Sampras uh, when he uh, first won the U.S. Open, man, he just dominated everybody, including Andre Agassi. He was a uh, uh, world's leading returner of serve and he beat him in straight sets and he had this whopping 135 to 142 mile per hour serve now people are hitting it 150 163 that's amazing uh so what i'm asking you about this is what is the minimum force that likely caused that serve given that the mass of a tennis ball has to be and i said minimum force here has to be between 1.975 ounces and 2.095 ounces which is really between 5.6 grams uh or excuse me 56 grams and 59.39 kilogram uh, grams 
at and that uh, and that the time of contact between the strings and the ball during a serve is about five milliseconds. Okay, uh, we know that we know, for instance, that the time of contact between a ground stroke, uh, let's say you swing your uh, tennis racket uh, to hit a ground stroke at 50 miles per hour. Uh, that's in contact with it for up to uh, two inches, one and three quarters to two inches. And that's about 0 0.002 seconds. And it turns out the faster you hit the ball, actually the, the larger amount of time that you're in contact with it. So faster ground strokes lead to even more con contact time and faster serves lead to more contact time as well. Uh, this measurement of five milliseconds was done on 120 uh, millisecond or excuse me 120 meter uh, mile per hour serve so we expect probably it might even be a little bit higher than five milliseconds for this 163 mile per hour serve so that's the problem i've got the data written down uh, i know the mass i know the uh the mass range i know the delta t uh what i'm wanting to find is the force and i'm going to use the change in momentum to do that so i'm going to stop sharing and now I'm gonna start sharing something else just so y'all can uh, sort of see what's happening with this. So I have this other Dumaflicky, which I think is, I'm trying to look for the right window. Not that one, that one, well, not that one, not that one. Not, uh, yeah, I guess it's this one. Uh, I am trying to look for this. Okay, so let me hold up a second. Let me go back to stop share. And now I'm going to see if I can share the right screen this time. There it is. Okay. So here is the famous serve. It's not in English, so I apologize for that, but you can watch Sam, Sam Growth on Australian. So that is the actual serve we're talking about. It's not all ways that we get to do uh, such problems uh, where we actually get to see the video proof of it. So again, what we have is uh, the initial velocity is equal to zero. The final velocity is equal to 163.7 miles per hour. And of course, to do this, we really need to convert it to meters per second. And we can do that by this long convoluted way, which I really like because it really gives you an exact uh, conversion. What I'll do is I'll take the fact that one mile is equal to 5,280 uh, feet. And I'll take the, the fact that one foot is equal to 12 inches. And then I'll take the fact that one inch is exactly 2.54 centimeters. That's how we define the centimeter and the meter and all that stuff went from there. Uh, or you can look at it as that's the way we define uh, the inch. And then we say, okay, well, I wanna get rid of centimeters. I happen to know there's 100 centimeters in one meter. So now I'm up to meters per hour. I want meters per second. So I'm gonna take uh, one hour and divide it by 3,600 seconds. When I do all that math, I will ultimately get 73.180 meters per second. That's pretty darn fast in meters per second. Remember about 22 uh, meters per second, 22.3 meters per second is 55 miles per hour. So this is uh, obviously quite a bit faster than that. So that's the final velocity. What I know is that F on average is equal to delta P over delta T. And we're pretty much just paying attention to this one and only force. And that's really what we want to know. So I'm gonna say that the final momentum, of course, is the mass of the ball times velocity. Well, the mass of the ball, which I was kind enough to give you uh, already in, uh, kilogram or excuse me already in grams what we were asked to do was calculate the minimum force so the minimum force occurs when the mass of the ball is the minimum obviously some balls will be heavier and the same force will result in a smaller uh, velocity 
So the minimum force should occur when the minimum mass is existing. So the min minimum mass was uh, basically uh, point, or it's the 1.975 ounces, which I converted to 0 0.056 gram, uh, kilograms. So 0 0.05600 kilograms. Get, people keep coming in. So that's the mass. The velocity is going to be 73.180 uh, meters per second minus zero over five times 10 to the negative third seconds. And you can call that 5.0. So this was uh, 56 grams was roughly what that was. And then delta T was 5.0 milliseconds. So when I do all this math, what it turns out to be is 819.62 Newtons, which is about 184 pounds. So that's a pretty significant force uh, with a tennis racket, uh, 184 uh, pounds. Uh, but that's basically what it would take to accelerate this ball that fast. Uh, the big thing is, can you really swing the racket that fast? Because it turns out you don't actually have to, if you want your tennis ball to leave at 73.180 meters per second, you don't have to swing your racket at 73.180 meters per second. Uh, there's a momentum transfer uh, that ultimately results. Also, there's a, a springing effect because of the strings that ultimately results in Basically, uh, the ball leaves the strings with, uh, at least on ground strokes, with exactly the same speed up to 1.30 uh, or 130% of the speed. So you can swing your arm at, you know, a certain speed, and then the, the actual serve could leave at well over 130% uh, of that speed. So that's kind of nice because that keeps them killing their arms. But uh, that's a pretty neat little problem. Just gives you uh, an idea of how large a force is required to hit a tennis ball 163.7 uh, meters per second or miles per hour. Any questions on that one? Can you just bring it a little closer? That's pretty blurry. Yes, yes, I can. And the light's off too, isn't it? Yeah, it was. If you have a cool HP calculator, it'll automatically convert your units. Uh, so you don't have to do all that stuff. But that's a big thing in, this, in physics is uh, it shouldn't be at the calculus-based physics level, but it still is. Uh, just not converting back to your base units is the uh, root of a lot of problems with students. So always remember, the base unit is always without the prefix except for mass. In the case of mass, the base unit is always the kilogram. So. If you always convert to the base units, you will always get it right, but sometimes you don't have to. So if you, if in doubt, go ahead and convert it out. <laughs> I made a rhyme. I'm so cool. Okay. What was the starting unit? Go ahead. What was the starting unit before you uh, It was 163.7 miles per hour. This one, 167 uh, miles per hour. I really hope someday the kilogram gets renamed to being the gram and and yeah, obviously the uh, ton is renamed the kilogram because so that just so that way it's more consistent overall because it still bothers me to this day that the that only one unit starts at kilo rather than just no prefix. <laughs> oh yeah, I, yeah, that's always bothered me too. It turns out that uh, basically we had already uh, committed ourselves to the kilogram when we decide to rationalize the system of units. Uh, and the gram is such a small unit of mass. I mean, it, it really is pathetically small. Put it this way, an ounce is what you're supposed to eat in a food serving. And that's like 28, 28.64 uh, or 26.87 uh, grams. So even that pathetically small serving of, of cereal you're supposed to have in the morning being an ounce, that's still like 30 grams. So you can imagine the gram is a, a pathetically small unit. And that, that's basically impractical to use that, I guess. But yeah, it, it does bother me. All right, let's try our second problem now. So back to problem here. 
So the second problem is a pressure washer pumps 10 gallons per minute and has a 1.32 millimeter aperture. There are about 264 gallons in a cubic meter and the density of water is uh, 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. A, how fast is the water leaving the nozzle? Uh, duh, B, got my letters wrong. B, what is the flow of water in kilograms per second? C, is that speed realistic? I said flow of water in kilograms per second. And uh, this was actually supposed, that's why I listed it as B, uh, is the speed realistic? Uh, C, uh, which should be D, the human femur takes about 4,000 newtons to break it. Other bones take much, much less. If a pressure washer were sprayed at a human's femur and the water hit the leg and stopped, uh, could it break the femur? No, in actuality, the leg would be bounce some of the water back and therefore take an even greater force because it's actually got to deliver enough force not only to stop the water, but it's actually got to reverse it. So uh, really, this should be right here because I put it in later. And now I get to change the letters all over again. So that's still going to be B. And this will be C again. OK. So how fast is the water leaving the nozzle? Let me write down the data. What we have is 10 gallons per minute. So the flow, flow is basically a measure of volume per time. So that's 10 gallons per minute. We also know that the aperture diameter is equal to 1.32 millimeters. And we know that uh, one cubic meter is equal to approximately 264 gallons. Now this one was kind of pain because when I went to look it up, there was a gallon U, there was a gallon C, and there was a gallon uh, and there is actually a significant difference, like the, gal the gallon in the UK was 291. So we're going to go with the, the regular straight gallon that I found on the internet. And I have to do some research more to find, find out what that, uh, those different ones are and which ones we're used to. Uh, but anyways, we also know we're given that the density of H2O is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. I think every... Uh, person studying any branch of science should be able to reel that number off instantly. Okay, it's 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. It's also one uh, kilogram per liter. It's also one gram per cubic centimeter. It's also one gram per milliliter. So that's kind of a neat little number that we should know. And what I want to know is F equals question mark because F break for a femur, and obviously the femur is the strongest bone in the human body. Uh, that takes 4,000 newtons. Uh, a toe bone, by the way, takes much less, and that's the origin of this problem. Uh, my mom, uh, who's not a traditional woman, she you know paints houses, builds things, and and does quite a bit of uh, what would often be called manly work. And she was pressure washing a house one time just because she likes doing that stuff. And she took and laid the pressure washer down on her toe uh, and broke said toe. <laughs> and that was the first instance where she met my wife because uh, we had to rush her to the emergency room that night because it, uh, it was still hurting, you know, seven hours later. So she went to the emergency room and found out her toe had been broken. So anyways, this is the origin of that problem. So let's go ahead and stop sharing and let's work it. So what we're trying to compute here is a force and a force is equal to delta P over delta T. So again, uh, force average, again, I'm, I'm really doing the total force, but I'm really just considering this one force because all the other ones are irrelevant. That's going to be delta P over delta T. Now, the delta P is a little bit of a weird thing. You might think, well, how are we going to go about doing this? I've got this stupid 100, uh, 10 gallons per minute. What does that mean? Well, let's work it out a bit, and we'll say flow, which notice has units of, let's say, L cubed over T. That's the typical dimensions of flow. It's a, a volume divided by time. And that's exactly what we have there, 10 gallons per minute. But we could realize that that is also a area, which would be a L squared times the L over T. 
So you might realize that flow is also area times velocity. And I think that makes some sense. If you imagine like a ice cream scooper, if you will, uh, or one of those pumps for ice cream, not scooper, uh, if it pumps out a certain cross-sectional area, right, that's the area A, and you multiply that by the length L, then you're going to get the volume, right? And if it does that in a certain amount of time, then you get the volume per time by taking A times L and dividing it by the T. So this is the A, and the L divided by the T really is the velocity. So that does make some sense. So I'm going to take the 10 gallons per minute. And I'm going to convert that uh, to cubic meters because the first question they asked us, remember, was uh, how fast is the water leaving the nozzle? So 10 gallons per minute, I'm going to go ahead and convert this to more reasonable units, i.e. kilograms, or excuse me, i.e. Uh, cubic meters per second. So I'm going to say one gallon or 264 gallons is equal to one cubic meter. So now I'm cubic meters per minute, but I also want it per second. So I know that one minute is equal to 60 seconds. So with that, I can now say that the cubic meters per second is, uh, I think I got six point or six thirty point nine times ten to the negative six cubic meters per second. Anybody want to confirm that for me? Uh, you might call it point six three zero times ten to the uh, negative three if you want. That's the same thing. Okay. So that's the actual flow. Now, I know the area is equal to, since they gave me the diameter, whenever just they say the size of an aperture, they're just referring to the diameter. So in that case, I have to use pi over 4 d squared. Well, that's pi over 4 times 1.32 times 10 to the negative third meters squared. So once I do that math, I'm going to say pi times 1.32 e to the negative 3 squared. And then I'm going to divide all that by 4. And I get 1.368. Oh, 1.368 times 10 to the negative 6 square meters. Okay, so that's my area. So I know that my velocity is equal to the flow over the area, which actually gives me flow 630.9 times 10 to the negative 6 cubic meters per second over 1.368 times 10 to the negative 6 square meters. You can see that the meter cubed divided by meter squared is just going to make it meters, and then I'm going to get meters per second. So I'm going to say uh, 630.9 e to the negative 6. Whoa, something's not calculating for me. 630.9 e to the negative 6 divided by one three 1.368 e to the negative 6 gives me 461.2 meters per second. So that's part A. Now part B is, is that reasonable? Can you bring that in a little closer? So that's a whole different scenario. Anybody know what that reference is? How, how fast is that? Anybody? You might, you probably don't know because we haven't covered this in our course yet, but the speed of sound is like 343 meters per second. 
so this is well over the speed of sound. If the water was actually leaving the nozzle at that rate, you would hear a uh, cracking of the sound barrier, basically. Uh, I hear a when it first starts up, uh, but it doesn't really strike me as being that fast. So I'm sure some friction effects and stuff like that are actually making it a little less, but we're gonna go ahead and calculate it just knowing that this is probably unreasonable. Could you bring it a little closer? It's pretty blurry. Yes. Now, here's the big part. I've got a, a number of cubic meters per second that's coming out. And if I were to multiply that by the density of water, which is in kilograms per cubic meter, I think you can see that that would convert the flow to basically the mass flow. In other words, the kilograms per second. And if you uh, multiply kilograms per second times the velocity, or excuse me, yeah, if you multiply kilograms per second times the velocity, that would give you basically our, yeah, that would basically give you kilogram meters per second squared, which is actually the unit of force. And that tells me that that is what I wanna do. So looking at it from a dimensional standpoint, I can say F is equal to delta P over delta T. Well, delta P is actually supposed to be M times delta V over delta T. So you can think about it that way. But I can also say uh, density would be mass over volume. So if I multiply density times flow, which I'll call F, well, actually, no, I'll call it flow because I already used F for force times flow. Notice this is kilograms per cubic meter times cubic meter per second. So this turns out to be kilograms per second. And then if I multiply that uh, by meters per second, our velocity, then I actually would have the entire change in momentum. So I'm going to take 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, that's the density of water, times the uh, 630.9 times 10 to the negative six cubic meters per second times the 461.2 meters per second. And that's gonna ultimately give me the force, which I'll write in here, but I'm gonna come up here and put the answer as well since it's getting so crowded in that corner. Now I do this math. Notice the units are working out to kilograms uh, per second times meters per second. That's kilogram meter per second squared, which is the unit of the force. So that makes me feel confident that I've done it right. And that really is how you sort of work this out. You have not been given the equations that relate flow and area and velocity, but you can, by thinking about little models like this, figure it out. So uh, that's what we did here. So 1,000 times 630.9 e to the negative 6 times 461.2. Again, knowing this velocity is not that reasonable, okay? Uh, I'm still gonna get a force and that force is gonna be 290.9. So I might as well call it 291 Newtons. So the answer is about 292 Newtons for number, this is part C, I guess, okay? So that's not enough to break a, a femur, of course. Uh, you would need about uh, 20 times as strong a force, but as you might imagine, the metatarsal, which is one of the bone that, that is above your toe, or one of the actual uh, toe bones itself, are probably small enough to be broken by that. 
And by the way, a 10 gallon per minute flow is a huge flow. That's sort of the top of the line in terms of pressure washers. Uh, and then the, you know, the thought that you're going to use that small of a, a aperture and really get that full speed is, is not unlikely. But still, uh, I will tell you without a doubt, there is 100% truth to the fact that pressure washers are strong enough to hurt you. So do not, do not, do not push them against your body. Do not uh, spray them at someone, especially up close, uh, because it will, will really hurt them. Uh, spraying it from a distance isn't going to be a big deal, but you know, if you're a good two or three feet away, that's probably okay. Uh, depending on the pressure washer, of course, if you do that with a fire hose, you can obviously knock people down. That's, that's one of the techniques we use to disperse rioters and stuff like that. So you can use fire hoses and <laughs> knock people all over the place. Uh, I suggest you watch videos on that. Uh, don't get involved with that yourself. All right. Uh, th so that was problem number two. Let's look at another one. So we've done a pressure washer. The questions were, uh, how fast is the water leaving the nozzle? We found 431. Is the speed realistic? No, because the speed of sound is 343 meters per second down to 330. It, it depends pretty heavily on temperature, by the way, the speed of sound. Uh, what is the flow of water in kilograms per second? Well, I got that by multiplying uh, the, uh, basically the gallons are the cubic meters per second times the density of water. And then finally D, the human femur takes about 4,000 Newtons to break. So I shouldn't have labeled that C, I should have labeled that D for this part. And go ahead and change that real quick, okay. So we've done all that problem, now we're doing number three. So number three says a 1500 kilogram car traveling at, oh, Evidently, you need an R in the word traveling. Who knew? Uh, traveling at 22 meters per second. Remember, like I told you, 22.352 meters per second is 55 miles per hour. So this is pretty close to 55 miles per hour. A 1,500 kilogram car traveling at 22 meters per second runs into a nearly identical parked car. I just mean, hey, it's probably about the same mass, so go with that, and gets stuck to it. Immediately after the collision, what is the speed of the two cars? So we're just using conservation of momentum uh, to actually work out the velocity of the cars immediately upon impact. Obviously friction forces and stuff like that are gonna slow it down immediately. But if, if you just for a second could imagine it taking off as if everything's on ice, this, is, this will be how fast they go. Now, what we're using here is, now that you've seen this, I've got a mass of 1500 kilograms. So I'm writing that down and I've got a velocity of uh, 22.0 meters per second. I'll keep it as if it's three sig figs. And now I'm going to stop share and show you my document cam. So that's what we're dealing with. It's going to hit a parked car. What I'm actually using here is the summation of the forces is equal to dp over dt. Now, uh, in order for this p to be a constant, in other words, conserving momentum means p is a constant, right? In order for this to be a constant, then the derivative of a constant, of course, is zero. So that means if the total force acting on the system is equal to zero, then dp dt equals zero, which means p equals a constant. Okay, that's where conservation of momentum comes from. The conservation law comes from Newton's second law. And basically it says, hey, if the summation of the forces is equal to zero, meaning if you add up all the forces and you get zero, then the derivative of momentum with respect to time uh, must also equal zero because that's the other half of Newton's second law. And that can only be true when P is a constant. So that's what we're using here. So initially, P initial is uh, basically M times V, and then P final would equal M plus M because now it's one big object with twice the mass basically because the cars are essentially identical times V final. That's the final momentum. Notice how I'm now taking it from a single particle to dealing with multiple particles. Only this case, it's a little like a, a baby step because the two particles are stuck together. So it doesn't seem so much like separate particles. Okay. 
So now conservation of momentum means that PI is equal to PF. And this is all one dimensional motion. That's why I'm not using vectors. So I'll say M times V is equal to 2M times V final. So that V final is actually equal to uh, one half of V. So V final is equal to one half of 22.0 meters per second. And since the masses were identical, we didn't even need the mass. And we found that in fact, the two cars will attempt to leave the collision scene at a velocity of 11 meters per second or about 28 miles per hour. Okay. Uh, if you've ever tried skimboarding or jumping on a skateboard while it's already moving, are even running along and trying to jump on a stationary skateboard, you've probably experienced this problem, okay? Uh, when you jump on a skimboard, for instance, which is a nearly frictionless situation, it's kind of nice because it's on that little skim of water, uh, and it has a mass, and then you have, of course, a much bigger mass, and if you perfectly match the speed, you can jump on it, and then because uh, momentum before was its mass times its velocity, and now it's and your plus your mass times that same velocity. If you jump on it, then you will actually have the same momentum. But and everything's fine. But if you jump on it with a slightly different speed, then that additional mass is going to actually cause the thing to slow down, and you end up falling forward on your face. Or if you, of course, uh, mis, uh, mismatch the speed the other way, then you fall behind it. Okay, so that's what gives you these difficulties when you're skimboarding or jumping on moving skateboards. I actually, the first time I ever had my wind knocked out of me, it was my attempt to ride a wheelie and lay my wheelie on the back of a skate or on the top of a skateboard. And I don't remember what happened, but all I remember is seeing pedals in the air and then getting up and couldn't breathe. Uh, it was horrible. But <laughs> anyways, uh, that is again, another conservation momentum problem that can bite you in the rear. Any questions on how that one was solved? So that's a typical momentum problem, an easy one. This is, uh, in, in fact, later we'll learn when we talk about uh, elastic collisions. Elastic collisions are collisions in which uh, the kinetic energy is conserved. This, by the way, is one called a perfectly inelastic collision. So when two objects stick together, uh, that's called a perfectly inelastic collision. So I'll write this down here just so you remember. And the reason why it's called perfectly inelastic, uh, kinetic energy being conserved is what, in, is what an elastic collision is. Uh, if you jump to the center of mass frame for, uh, for a perfectly inelastic collision, when two objects stick together, then uh, like in this case, these two objects, if you had jumped to the center of mass frame, the center of mass frame would be moving to the right at 11 meters per second, right? So in that frame, what you see is the first car moving at 11 meters per second to the right, and the other car moving at 11 meters per second to the left. When those two collided uh, the, in the center of mass frame, the velocity is now zero because it's moving along with the center of mass. And you'd see that all the kinetic energy completely disappeared. So that's where the origin of perfectly inelastic came from because in the center of mass frame, all the kinetic energy is lost. Now let's try number four. So let's share screen again. No one have any questions? Looks like we're going then, okay. So that was number three. Number four, here's the problem I was telling you about. Again, it has nothing to do with the Colorado thing. Uh, I just, like I said, it's a typical recoil problem. So an AR-15 has a muzzle velocity of 1,006 meters per second or 3,300 feet per second. Uh, obviously, that's faster than the speed of sound, uh, and, and that's what part of the loud gun noise you hear is when something breaks the sound barrier. Uh, that loudness is uh, basically a pressure wave hitting your ear uh, coming from the leading bow shock of the actual bullet cutting through the air. 
uh, when firing the Remington .223 round. So the Remington .223 is a round of 3.6 gram mass. Uh, the mass of the AR-15 is actually about uh, 3.0 kilograms. They advertise it as 6.5 pounds. Uh, so what I want to know is what is the recoil? So what do I mean by what is the recoil? I'm going to write this data down real quick. I'm going to say the little m is the mass of the bullet. And obviously that is 3.6 grams. The big m is the mass of the rifle, which is 3.0 kilograms. The big V, I'm going to say, is the velocity of the bullet, and that's 1,006 meters per second. And little v recoil, so I'll write v sub rc is the question mark. And I think I've got all the data now. Okay, so let me stop sharing now that I've got the data. And uh, what we have initially is a person holding a gun, and the total momentum is zero. So P initial is equal to zero. The bullet's not moving. The rifle's not moving. So the velocity of both of those initially is zero. P final, on the other hand, is equal to the mass of the bullet times the big velocity it had. And this is an F. I made it so small, it's hard for you to see. So PF is the mass of the bullet times the big velocity it had plus the mass the big mass of the rifle times V recoil. Now, the total force acting on this gun uh, is in some sense zero, so we expect momentum to be conserved because what we're really saying here is let's imagine we just sort of stuck this rifle up on uh, two posts and had it automatically by remote control squeeze the trigger how fast would the rifle take off to the left? That's what recoil is, okay? And by knowing that speed, that gives you an idea of uh, what it's gonna feel like on your shoulder, especially if you're not careful when you go to shoot the gun and you don't have it braced against your shoulder or God forbid, more specifically, some people hold it in front of their eye <laughs> when it fires the whole rifle butt comes back and hits them in the face at that velocity. So that's really what we're trying to calculate. That's obviously problematic. So uh, in that situation, the total force is zero. So we know that P initial is equal to P final. So we know that zero is equal to MV plus big M VRC. So from that, we can see the VRC, this is the recoil velocity, is negative mass of the bullet divided by the mass of the rifle times the big velocity. So that's going to be negative 0 0.0036 kilograms over 3.0 kilograms times 1,006. Whoa, left out of zero there. 1,006 meters. No, I left. That was right. 1,006 meters per second. So when I do this calculation, I get negative 1.21 meters per second for the recoil velocity. And the negative just means that, hey, I considered the bullet going to the right positive. So clearly the rifle is going to shoot to the left and therefore be in the negative direction. And that 1.21 meters per second, to give you some perspective, what's that in miles per hour? It's probably going to be on the order of three or four miles per hour. I can check that really quickly with my HP variety calculator. So I'll say uh, 1.21 1 units, change the speed, change the meters per second, add zero miles per hour to that. That's a quick and dirty way to do it. Yeah, it's 2.7 miles per hour. Not quite as big as I thought. 2.7 uh, miles per hour. So imagine something six and a half pounds hitting you at about three miles per hour. That, that's going to feel pretty good. Luckily, the, the AR-15 is actually kind of heavy. So I, I say just compared to, to some guns. So it doesn't really have that bad of a recoil. Uh, that It also helps that it's firing such a light bullet. And that's really why it gets such a large velocity. And that light bullet that's a, you know, that's a whole different story. This is part of the reason why uh, the Marines 
uh, say that the AR-15 is in some sense worse than the M60, just in the sense that they normally are talking about uh, because of the small round and the high muzzle velocity, that small round will get inside of a body and just tear it all to pieces. It, it ricochets here and there. So it's a, it's a, it's a lethal weapon considering uh, the fact that it's not nearly as powerful as some of the more military, uh, some of the weapons that the military uses, but in some sense, it's actually worse uh, as some uh, Marine reports uh, have said, you can check out that Marine report yourself. Uh, but it's it, like I said, it's just that it's fun to shoot. I, I love shooting them. They're, they're kind of awesome that way. So uh, anyways, let's go to our next problem. Anybody have any questions on that one before I go to the next problem? Should make yeah, pretty good um, sense. Yeah, go what it. the um, what the formula when you're trying to find the uh, the average force? I'm confused by um, what is the D supposed to represent? Is that saying the chain? Oh, that that that, that triangle. Yeah, that triangle is uh, capital delta, and that means uh, change in momentum. No, not that. I meant uh, finding the sum of so, the force. And it's like D, DP over DT. Oh, okay. That, yeah, this is a derivative. So that's the derivative of momentum with respect to time, DP over DT. You got that now, Lauren? Yeah. All right. So here's our next problem, problem number five. Uh, what are the two outcomes of a cue ball elastically colliding? I don't know if that's supposed to be a single word. Let's, let's see what happens when I put a single word in there. This is always exciting to learn some, oop, 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 to learn some English while you're going. But nope, nope, I'm gonna think I'll go with cue ball. Cue ball, I don't know if it's hyphenated or whatever. Uh, clearly an eight ball. Maybe that's supposed to be hyphen. Let's put a hyphen in there. All right. Okay. So what are the two outcomes of a cue ball elastically colliding, colliding with a resting eight ball? So uh, here's the introduction that you need. So elastic collisions. We don't have any data here, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. You, you can figure out what is going on. But an elastic collision... conserve kinetic energy. Whoa. And remember what half mv squared is kinetic energy. So what that means is the total kinetic energy initially is equal to the total kinetic energy Finally, so all the things taking part in collisions, and that can be 50,000 things, you add up all the momentums or the kinetic energy that each of those things have, and that's the left hand side, and then they all collide, and then you add up all those things again uh, for the right hand side, and that makes the right hand side, you set them equal to each other. That's what elastic collision means. So in this case, we're talking about a cue ball. So this is number five. We're talking about a cue ball rolling with a velocity v along a pool table essentially right it's going to run into it has a mass m of course it's going to run into an eight ball okay that has a velocity equal to zero but also has the same mass m that's sort of the nature of cue ball of uh, pool balls they're all about the same mass right so uh we know because the net force on these is gonna be zero, momentum will be conserved. So momentum being conserved is sort of the low hanging fruit. Uh, almost all collisions, especially if they're really big and massive because the little forces of friction and stuff like that are so small compared to the forces of collision that you can almost always ignore the total force uh, acting on it. Uh, in this case, you've got a normal force acting upward. You've got gravity acting downward. Those, of course, obviously add to be zero. You've got a small friction force that tends to slow the balls down. 
again, compared to the force that this ball is going to apply to the other ball, that's pretty small unless, you know, you, you baby hit it or something. So generally speaking, this is a conservation momentum problem. And with collisions, you can almost always uh, assume that uh, collision is occurring such that uh, momentum is conserved. So P initial is just M V one initial. Okay. And it's a vector quantity. So I'll put the vector quantity up there. P final, on the other hand, is going to be M V one final plus M V two final like that. So we've got M V one initial is equal to M V one final plus M V two final. But notice all those masses are the same. So you can divide them out and I just get this nice expression conservation of P implies V1 initial is equal to V1 final plus V2 final. In other words, it's just a vector addition problem, right? The final velocity, or excuse me, the initial velocity of the cue ball is equal to the sum of the final velocities. Now, when we say kinetic energy is conserved, so it's elastic, implies uh, KE initial is equal to KE final. Well, KE initial is going to just be one half MV1 initial squared. And KE final is going to be one half MV1 uh, final squared plus one half MV2 final squared. So we get one half MV1 initial squared is equal to one half MV1 final squared plus one half MV2 final squared. Or just like we got here, we got V1 initial squared is equal to V1 final squared plus V2 final squared, just as magnitudes. So this gives us two scenarios. Does anybody recognize what this formula would be? Does this look like anything in terms of vectors? Can you just bring yeah. it up closer? Yeah, maybe like position or velocity. Uh, it, it's definitely dealing with the velocity, but uh, do you remember anything from, say, geometry or uh, making vectors that has a formula that looks like that second one? Kind of looks like a formula for a circle. It's a Pythagorean theorem. Or, yeah, that. exactly. <laughs> So we've got the one vector V1i is equal to the sum of two vectors. And then we've got the magnitude of that one vector is equal to the sum of the squares. So what that means is that uh, V1 final could be this way. We couldn't see it. V2 final could be this. Oh, yeah, y'all can't see that. V2 final could be that way. And then V1 initial would be that way. So one outcome is that uh, V1 final and V2 final are perpendicular. Such that there, some of their squares add up to give you the square of V1i, and that's actually the result, okay? So one, one result is these, two balls go off at 90 degree angles. That's kind of helpful if you're uh, actually playing pool. And in fact, the only thing that makes it slightly less true than being elastic is spin. So you can actually control that a little bit. But if you just try to hit one sitting still, you're going to get that. But does anybody ever know, uh, know of another outcome that you've seen before? It could deflect. If you hit a cue ball into an eight ball? What's that? It could kind of like deflect and go off go at an angle. 
Yeah, it, this is that one. This is that going off at an angle. But because of the friction and stuff, the angle's not always exactly 90. But have you ever seen another one uh, it, that it happens? It kind of like stops. I'll give you a hint. Newton. There you go. So the other solution, this is number one. The other solution is uh, V1 final is equal to zero and V2 final is equal to V1 final. So that's the two common solutions to a two-dimensional, or actually it could be even three-dimensional, elastic collision of identical mass objects. There's two choices. Either they're going to leave each other uh, at right angles, and the sum of the squares of their final speeds will be equal to the square of the initial speed of the initial ball, or It'll be like Newton's cradle where you pick up, you know, one ball and it falls down and hits the five balls and then only one ball on the other end pops out. Or if you do two, the same thing happens. That's what Newton's cradle is about. Everybody know Newton's cradle? Yeah, my cousin has one like in his Let's office. Yeah, yeah, they're kind of fun to play with. Uh, and it's neat because you can uh, lift up two balls there it is newton's cradle you can lift up two balls and then two will pop out you lift up three and then that's really weird because three will pop out uh that means one keeps moving all the time so here's one this is a giant newton's cradle i haven't seen this before five seconds for a six second video oh nope it's 1.03 that's good 103. Really? You give me two commercials? What a jerk. Yeah, YouTube's pretty annoying okay, with now that. Now we can go. <laughs> Getting a lot of advertising, aren't they? So this is an exact example of that elastic collision that we just saw. Oh, you said ball. I said big ball. I think they're overplaying it. Amazing is not really what I'd say. Let's see it move. Come on now. Oh, we're almost getting to the motion. Hold on here. So you see, uh, in this case, this is the second scenario where the first ball stops and the second ball leaves, ideally with the exact same speed. Obviously, you're actually losing some energy because you hear the sound. The sound is an indication that you're losing energy. Uh, these balls will actually warm up over time, so they're losing energy through that. Uh, and you can see there's a little wobble. Uh, and there's, of course, friction forces that tend to make them uh, stick together, or gravitational and friction forces that tend to make them stick together. That's stealing energy as well. Uh, but in general, if you lifted the ball up an angle 30 degrees, then the other ball would uh, lift up an angle of 30 degrees after you hit it. That's kind of cool, right? And all it takes to get Big ad dollars is a pretty girl in a pink sweater, and we don't even know if she's pretty. She's just got a pink sweater. <laughs> of course, all women are, are pretty in every in some ways. So anyways, now we're back to why is that still going? Maybe because I didn't stop it. OK, now, now we're back to our video. So does anybody have any questions on this stuff? Right now, we're actually met the end of our time period. Uh, as always, I'm going to wait here for the last person to leave. Remember, you have a test uh, that is due on Monday night at 11.59 p.m. You get four attempts at this one. Uh, I have to moderate it to make sure uh, people have their uh, extended time. Same thing with the practice test. I'll work on that, too. Next time, we'll jump into section 9 point, uh, I believe it's 9.4. Yeah.
uh, 9.5, excuse me. I'm going to do that derivation and we'll finish off chapter nine next time. Uh, until then, I definitely recommend you check out some of my YouTube videos. I have one where you have a cannon inside of a cannon and cannonballs inside of a train car type thing. And you fire the cannon so that the uh, cannon is actually attached to the to the train car and the recoil of the cannon causes the whole train car to move off to the left. But then once the cannonball gets to the other end of the train car, it's going to deliver a momentum to the train car to make it come to a stop. And from that, you can use conservation of momentum to solve for how far it actually moved because it's going to have to actually move. And lo and behold, you can use the exact same problem, but use center of mass calculations and reach the exact same conclusion. So those are two of the coolest physics problems uh, I've ever uh, solved, especially during uh, regarding momentum. The other stuff is, of course, modern physics is usually pretty cool, but definitely check those out. There's a, a few problems for you to check out on YouTube. I've already put links to them on your uh, Canvas course. Uh, as I said, you guys are free to go. I will see you Thursday. Be safe, get your test done, start doing your tests, uh, work a lot of problems, and have fun. Have a nice week, Professor Younger. You too. Thank a you. Quick question. Um, what chapters is the yes. test covering? Seven and eight. Seven and eight. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, let me double check on that quick while you're here. So uh, just to make sure I didn't lie to you, uh, here we are. Uh, here are modules. Eight and nine. Okay, so it's eight and nine. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if seven was on the last test or not. So the midterm went to chapter seven. So yeah, it'd be eight and nine. I apologize for that. Now I know why I waited for it because it's eight and nine and I'm doing it chapter nine now. Uh, I think that's still reasonable. I might switch it instead of being due Monday. I might switch it to being due Wednesday, but I, I think this gives you ample uh, time to do it. We'll, we'll play it by ear though. The practice test is up there. The actual test is up there and, and thank you. That is chapter eight and nine. Uh, so I might actually, and I'm almost certain I will change it to Wednesday instead of being due uh, Monday. In fact, let me do that now. Okay. Thank you. Have a good one. Uh, no problem. You folks are free to go. Have a good one. Anybody else have any questions? I am going to go ahead and change that date to Wednesday, just in case, because I want to give y'all, uh, you know, I'm going to finish chapter nine next time, and I, I want to make sure y'all had plenty of time to deal with it. So uh, I think that does it, because you can do most of the problems already, uh, just from today's lecture and the problems that I posted. Uh, but anyways, I'll move it to Wednesday. Anyone else have any questions? I have I'm a here question. all day. Yes. Professor, I have a Okay, um, I'm not sure if you've seen my Canvas message, yeah. but I asked if you could extend the Chapter 8 homework. Okay, yeah, so. Because I already have. Uh, yeah, most I, th of it I think I remember seeing an email from you. Yeah, I already have most of it done. I just wanted to, there's just a few more things that I wanted to add to it. Uh, how does it work when you have y'all noticed how it works when you submit it, uh, say on time, and then you get a couple parts that you come back and do later? Does it make you, does it take like five per points off for each day for just the problems you do, or does it uh, do it for all of them then? I does anybody honestly, know how that behaves? I don't know. I've never um, done it late or turned in a problem late. So, gotcha. Let me, uh, let me, I'll get back with you and let you know what I'm going to do with that regarding, uh, I'll do it by email. So it's just between you and I, but anyways, I gotta, uh, I gotta think about it. Cause, uh, we basically, the way I set it up is you're allowed to do it. And then if you uh, do it late, then it's supposed to be five points off for each day thereafter. I'll look at your case and see, uh, see what's going on. And, and I may or may not do that, but I'll send you an email and let you know, Jasmine. Okay. Sounds good. Email, Thank you. So I don't forget that. Thank you. Anybody else? Got a lot of people in here. Alexi, did you like my tennis discussion today? Alexi might not even be there. Uh, Andy, Jason, anybody, anyone? 
No, I'm all set. All right. Looks like everybody's up. Okay. Have a good one, everybody.